Hey everyone, ADV here. I've got a delight today. I've got Matt Roski of Cultivate Elevate, which is really cool because we had sort of like a similar thing happen around the same time with electroculture because I sort of figured out my electroculture scenario as a gardener, which I had not delved into before. And I've actually, you know, did a lot of wire wrapping and setting them in the soil. And I started getting interesting results, but uh, interestingly enough, not so much with the gardening aspect, but from the geoengineering chemtrail clearing. And I was shocked at what I was seeing with my skies. It was really quite remarkable. So we'll get into that. We're going to talk about electroculture and all things electricity and energy. And I'm really excited to have you here, Matt. So thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me on. And I'm happy to talk about the topic. Yeah, great. I mean, there's so many topics that this entwines into, right? Like it's one rabbit hole after another, because, you know, what it taps into and quite literally is free energy. And we have a world that seems to ignore the ether and the energy around us while they wax on about climate change and trying to heal the earth, while at the same time they geoengineer our weather and damage our soils and damage the ether and do like exactly the opposite of really where we need to be going. So it's really a, an important topic for people to understand because when you realize that free energy, it's right there. It's literally like here, it's like, I'm grabbing it right now. You know, I mean, it's right there for us to use and how in the past we had incredible buildings that were able to pull that electricity into usable um, scenarios for lighting and heating needs, et cetera, that we've lost. So people think that we've come from sort of like barbarian past, right? Like this cave dweller kind of past, but really we came from genius. And I think we've just been falling and falling ever since. And that's the story, you know, they tell us. So why don't you tell our listeners, you know, how this, how you came about this information and, you know, what was your kind of spark, your aha moment with electroculture? So there's a couple things with this. And the first one we want to talk about is how they removed ether off the periodic table in about 1908. So it used to be on the periodic table, and this information was all there before 1908. Then they did a little revision, and then Einstein took over with the electricity and all of his work. So that kind of tweaked everything, and he pretty much debunked ether and got rid of all of that information. So that, that when I learned that, I go, okay, well, this kind of makes sense why we don't learn about it, because you can't go to school and learn about ether anymore because it doesn't exist anymore, according to the periodic table. But I got into this when I was doing an Akashic reading in 2019. I had a lady who told me to look into crop circles and she said, you know, you'll be able to read them. And I thought, okay, I don't know what that means. But what was interesting about the Akashic reading was she told me my entire life. She told me how my personality was. She told me about how you know, I'm always kind of seeking knowledge, you know, all these things that like, kind of like to myself, all these things that really just kind of blew my mind. And she was 2000 miles away in Ireland. So for her to get every single thing correct, I was like, okay, she must know about something with these crop circles. And so what happened was when I got into crop circles, I started studying things about Mary Hardy with the pyramid power and pyramid energy, her building pyramids and helping children focus because her child couldn't focus. So they'd put actually a dunce cap or a pyramid on top of their head so that the cells would spin back the opposite way so that her child could focus. So when I got into that, I was like, this is pretty remarkable. And then I moved into things with pyramids and all the things that the Russians were doing with pyramids where they would put pyramids all over the place and they would start to notice that plants would start to come back to life, which were extinct for up to 50 to 100 years just because of creating these vortexes around the land. So as I got into the pyramids, I started looking into pyramid energy. I started looking into Victor Schauberger, Justin Christo Flo, George Lakovsky. I even started looking into things such as static fields and how everything relates to static fields. And this is a, a document that goes into atmospheric energy and atmospheric energy patents and how that all of this existed, like you said, 1910, it was all there. And so as I got into the work of Victor Schauberger, it was pretty remarkable how he understood how everything should be vortexed, our water should be vortexed, you know, our cells should be vortexed, and how the energetic principles of vortexing occurs. And I got into this one part of his book, Living Water, and this is kind of what set me off with the whole electroculture movement. And I started talking about it and kind of going from there. But 
I was reading one of the parts of his book where he was talking about how they presented copper tools for gardeners and farmers and all these people. And he said, if we use these copper tools, we'll increase yields, we'll have more food, we won't have food shortages. And this was in 2020 when they were orchestrating all those food shortages. So I thought there's got to be a solution for that. And so he basically told the Bulgarian government, we're going to create all these copper tools and it will increase yields and you'll get rid of all the iron tools that you're using because of all the rust and all the heat that's being created in the soil and just use these copper tools and you guys will have abundance. And he saw this with so many different farms. And what happened was they put out a broadcast because they were getting a kickback from the fertilizer company that if you use copper tools in the garden, you'll yield too much food and not make enough money. So as soon as I learned about that, I thought, okay, well, I wonder what we can do with copper. So I started reading into Justin Cristo flow and all of his antennas and the coils and everything that you described. And I decided I was going to try it for myself. And I put some, I put a piece of wood and wrapped it with copper, placed it into my garden, into my Moringa pot. And I had 14 to 22 inch Moringa pots. The average Moringa pot is about six inches. So just on the balcony, third floor, Scottsdale Road, you know, all the noise and lights and cell phone towers and all the nonsense. And my Moringa just went crazy. And I started to notice, I started to notice more bees. I started to notice hummingbirds. I started to notice bats, praying mantises, grasshoppers. I mean, anything you can think of was on my balcony. And it really started to make me realize that we are not taught about any of this energy. It's like you said, it's all around us. You know, and after the third grade, we stop learning about atmospheric electricity or atmospheric energy. And if we start tapping into this, we can be having abundance. And what really blew my mind altogether was I found a newspaper article from 1835, Royal Agriculture Society of Australia and New South Wales, where they were using electroculture and writing essays about electroculture and how it increased their yields. So when you get into this topic, it has been around for so long and so many people have been using it. But over time, as the chemical companies came in and the fertilizers and pesticides and all that, we started using all of that instead of tapping into the beautiful Mother Earth energy. And that's kind of where it bloomed. And then so I did a couple of videos. They kind of went a little crazy and everybody started testing out electroculture. And it was remarkable to see all of this and people sending me pictures of gigantic beets, which I'll show today and a whole bunch of other stuff and things like that. And it just kind of went nuts. And now, you know, it's cool to see how much we can elevate, you know, the earth. And like you said, clean up the skies too, because everything we do down here is also going up there as well. So, you know, we can make a much larger imprint or impact than we really realize. And it starts with just even just a few antennas and putting them into your backyard. Yeah, that's amazing. And just the history of it. And I always am so amazed how ignorant we've become, you know, I'm saying the royal we of the, you know, the general masses, when we have literal computers in our pockets, and so much information about this is available, well, less and less each day as they erase the internet, but, you know, it's still there to be found, or if you, even if you go into a library and you seek it, you will find it. But we're so lost, like we just you know, you talk to the average person about this, they'll just get glazed over, like they'll get the fluoride stare going on, you know, and it's really a testament to how dull we've become because we've lost this connection to the earth. I mean, people, you know, they might know about grounding, maybe a little bit or earthing, you know, but they don't understand the concept of living waters. And that actually, you know, through some other experiments that have been done, how it's actually conscious and it reacts and responds to us. And uh, we can imprint those waters with our words, with all of these, even our thoughts. I mean, just it, getting into frequency knowledge and for my path, uh, you know, medicine, the frequency medicine, I mean, that's just blowing up now on so many levels. And I'm eager for the tipping point where enough people are going to hold this energy together and then more and more will wake up to these solutions. But how do we get around inventions that have happened 
that then, you know, the inventor suddenly dies, like Stan Myers, you know, invented water car. We have like, they already had electrical vehicles back when that didn't need charging stations, right? You know, we had all the technologies and they've taken that away. So, you know, what do you see as like the road back to this awareness? Like, where's the lead in for us to overcome, you know, the chemical companies and the corrupt politicians, and these sort of things? Like, what do you vision for the future as this knowledge continues to expand? Well, I think it starts with your own home and your own backyard, you know, because they're always trying to do a whole bunch of nonsense. I mean, every time I sign on social media, there's more nonsense they're trying to pull and they're, you know, attempting they're going to pull or might not because they just want to play mind games with us. But I really think it starts with our backyard. You know, taking back our food, I think, is really important. You know, if you go back to the 1940s, I think 60 percent of everybody used to grow all their food in their backyard. You know, that's who was supporting the war. You know, so if you go back into that, think of how much food people used to have, because if every person could just trade and barter and give food to each other, that takes one thing off of, you know, the system that we're dependent on. And then if we get into the water situation, you know, people can look into primary water, they can go into dousing, you know, they can find primary water, which is unlimited water, the feet, the water that's underneath our feet at all times, 24-7, 365. That takes another step away, you know, because what they're trying to do is they're trying to take away everything that we're obviously dependent on. But if we create our own independence on these things and we start tapping back into these things, then we can start to basically have resolutions. I mean, or a revolution, in my opinion. And that's what I think electroculture started. Because at one time, and this is, I thought, a fascinating stat, was 2020, you had 150,000 people searching for gardening uh, per month. Then 2021, it jumped to like 300,000. Then 2022, it jumped to like 3.5 million people per month. Absolute wow. just crazy changes. And then as people I saw doing electroculture, not only are they learning about electroculture, then they learn about water. Then they learn about if we get into, you know, atmospheric energy and how you can capture atmospheric energy over certain heights, you know, using different types of devices and things like that. And the thing is, is that's the biggest thing I get fact checked and censored on is abundance. You know, anytime I talk about this topic, it's like instantly, boom. You know, I even showed oil, unlimited oil coming out of the earth. Boom, instant fact check, you know, it's fake, whatever. It's like, it's coming right out. You can see it, you know, all the time. So I think the more we kind of unlearn the nonsense that we've been told and see it the opposite side, do the opposite of whatever you're told, you know, then the more we can then change as a group and a community. And I see this, I think, personally on Telegram and all these other platforms where people are just kind of waking up and they're over it. You know, and that's the other part. We have to get to a point where do you want, you know, weird things injected into your food and all this other weird stuff that they're trying to do? We have to take a stance and it starts with our home, you know, and even I've told people even too about like even getting rid of Wi-Fi and removing all of that out of your house, taking these things, hardwiring your devices. Every little step makes a difference because if you're healthy, your family's healthy and you can make other families healthy too. And then who's going to do what or tell you what to do because you're healthy. If you've been weakened and you've had your food taken from you, your water and all these things and whatever else, then all of a sudden, well, you're in control. They have control over you. So I kind of see it as I feel like personally, electroculture was the start of a lot of other movements that all happen at the same time, which are beautiful. And I think the more we get in tune with gardening and our food and understanding where it comes from and the energy principle, the more we then connect back into it. Because when you see how hard it is and the challenges that come with food and soil and this and that and little, you know, you know, things, one, maybe something wants to eat all your food because they know it's organic. You know, you start to see a little different thing that also can help, you know, change our minds and then help change the next generation. Because the coolest part was I had an eight year old tag me on YouTube who had gigantic squashes and he's walking around with the camera and he's like, I'm doing electric culture. You know, my, my garden's growing so fast. And I thought that's what needs to happen. Because the next generations, too, are a part of this. And if they don't know this, then they're just going to be dependent on some, you know, Gates, weird stuff and whatever else. Yeah, my child is just about to turn 12. And when I say any of these things, she's like, yeah, mom, I know. Yeah, I know. You know, I don't even really have to go through the details with her. It's like she automatically, because I didn't poison her and I taught her about this world, this realm, she, you know, she sees what I do and she just gets it like that. There's not really, I don't need to like pour over it or convince her or anything because it is natural. 
And if you just leave well enough alone, <laughs> the children will get it. They will understand these basic principles because they are of life and you didn't cut off that source to life. And it's just as natural as breathing is understanding these things. And getting the children involved in the gardening is really important at a young age as well, so that they that's normal for them. Growing food, saving seeds, these sorts of things. We would go to seed sharing, you know, every year we would all go to come together as a community and do seed swapping, this sort of stuff. And I was really passionate about permaculture gardening and hugel beds. And you can get it, you can get as fancy as you want, but you don't have to either, you know because you can just figure the out these systems and ones that work for you. And actually, I wanted to ask you about this because, you know, when I dove into it, I was confused a little bit at the beginning because there are different methods. Like there were ones where, you know, you're digging channels, you're doing like ley lines, you're laying underground wires that are connecting. Some rods are just coils. Some have sort of spikes at the top of them. And I wasn't sure if there were like studies, comparative studies done to say, you know, what is the most effective for your region or is that the best way? So what kind of method, you know, from your studies have you found is like the most efficient electroculture setup? So this can, you can get very complicated with a lot of this, but a simple coil wrapped around wood seems to work very well. And I've had a lot of success with a lot of people doing just a simple piece of wood wrapped with copper and making coils because you're creating an induction coil and you're just helping the electricity flow from the earth up into your plants and all around. Now, the wind will help gather that atmospheric energy. So the taller you go, the more atmospheric energy you will then capture. So usually you wanna go over about six feet when you're creating your antennas. Now, if we take it a step further and we go into like things of the old world and things of atmospheric energy, you can either use crystals on top of your antenna so that you can create a piezoelectric effect and those are squeezed when you wrap that with copper and have that on top. So you're creating almost like a ball, or you can even use something like a copper ball or a brass ball. That's what all those old world buildings used to have on top. You used to see a brass ball and then you'd see an antenna on top. That brass ball gathers static. And it's there's a certain coil or a, I think it's Hermo Colts or something. There's a certain type of a ball that they use where they would gather static. So you can do things like that. But the simplest way is just some simple crystals. That's why I, I like to stick to something simple like lapis or something like lodestone, you know, all the different types of stones. Because the other thing too, is you get the reflection of the color spectrum. The part of the copper, which is really fascinating, I've been studying, I don't know if you ever heard of him, Carl von Reichenbach. He created Ode Energy, which is Odial Energy. So he's before Orgone, he's before Wilhelm Reich. He's 1750s to 1850s. He was basically explaining that he would do tests on people who were sensitive to energy. And he noticed that like the copper, the specific metal would emit a red hue just naturally like a fire when it was in the dark. And then it would also emit a green hue. And what's the most common thing when you see people have copper, it starts turning green and patina ink. That's actually a color spectrum coming off of it. So if we take electroculture into another level, you could be adding different colors and different spectrums to the antenna so that you can get all these different colors, just like the rainbow. So you're almost like you're creating an antenna with a prism that reflects certain colors and then also conducts electricity at the same time. So you can take it to so many different things. And the fun part is you can mess around with it and have fun with it. You know, I've seen so many different designs. I've seen little, you know, piece of toothpicks wrapped with copper. I've seen coils. I've seen, like you said, the, the more complex ones where they're running north to south so that they can track the north and south energy, you know, running copper all the way across. You know, I've seen people attach it to the roof and run it all the way down. You know, you can mess around and see what works with your land because everybody's land is different. You know, if you walk around with dousing rods, you can determine kind of where you want to put things to. But, you know, there's frequencies everywhere. And a lot of people always ask, well, which way do I coil things, you know, because of the Northern Hemisphere, Southern Hemisphere, and all these things. What I've started to learn to say is just go with how your plants are coiling in your backyard, because everybody is different. Everybody's got different spins. You know, you go to Sedona, you got both at the same time, but, you know, go with whatever your plants are doing and follow that coil or that movement. And that will help bring that movement onto your property and help increase that because, what I realize is with all of this is it's just vortex and magnetism. It's the words we don't talk about anymore because now we have electricity. So you're just increasing, you know, the, the life force energy in your backyard and all in your house and everything.
And that's pretty much what starts to happen. Wow, this that Matt, he has brass balls. <laughs> you should get a shirt or something with that. Or in the it'd back of your truck. It would be the catchphrase. <laughs> That's right. But think and, of too, and not to, I don't mean to even cut you off, but think of brass knuckles, right? Brass knuckles are copper and zinc that creates a battery. So that's what's making the hands strong when they're using them. And then when you think of like, you go into the stuff with the Pope and all the, you know, the people who are in all the religious buildings, they have gold and copper and all these metals that are all conductive materials. That's what they're holding. All of their staffs are made out of conductive materials. So all we're doing is just increasing that conductivity. And that's the same as brass knuckles too, increasing the conductivity of the hand. Right. And we're pulling that energy into ourselves so we can bring it to ourselves. We can bring it to the plants. We can heal animals with it. We can do all kinds of healing with it. And, you know, that's sort of where my road into all of this knowledge was. And interesting, you mentioned the color spectrum because my very first interest or peak in health at all had to do with color therapy. And Dr. McNaughton was, you know, back in the 1900s, he was using like color films overlaid onto people to correct where they were in their um, biofield to elicit, you know, health and recovery from disease. And so say you have a plant that is doing poorly, maybe there's a blight or maybe there's an infestation of some sort, instead of poisoning it with chemicals, you could tune into the plant, you know, with the electroculture and then find the correcting crystal and see if that will adjust, you know, whatever that may be a deficiency, say the soil is deficient in something and it needs to be encouraged to have a different upkeep. I'm sure there'll be signed. You could do all kinds of scientific papers on to get really geeky, but you know, I think it's more important to trust your intuition and to tune into the plant. I mean, how did we even learn about all the medicines of plants back when there were, we didn't have, you know, <laughs> these types of, of laboratories to like figure out what was going on. We tuned in and communicated with the plant spirit to get that information and knowledge about what it was for. And so we, it's like, we have to remember who we are and tap into our inner gifts and doing so like even I'm sure there'll be like a population of staffs, like rods and staffs that will <laughs> be able to one day purchase, right. For our own energy, for our own, you know, just walking a walking stick, but it grounds us at the same time as, you know, pulls in that energy and gives it to us. I can see that in the future, you know, one question I had, but, or more of a comment was about when you mentioned crop circles, because I was so interested in crop circles years and years ago, I was like, what is this? Like, how is this happening? And how does it happen spontaneously? But this explains it. I mean, the consciousness of water the co and the ether, that coiling, because always you look at, even at the micro level, even if you look under a microscope, there's coiling happening in all of these crop circles. And so something is happening there from the, you know, connection to the earth, to the ether that is creating spontaneously this communication like to us. I don't think it's aliens. <laughs> you know, I don't think it's demonic. I don't think it's the government secrets programs. I think it's like the earth speaking and trying to say something to us. What do you feel about the crop circles? It's funny that you instinctively just said that because that's kind of what I've realized they are. They're cymatics of the earth speaking to us. And what's interesting is there's videos where these little orbs come about and then yes. you the design being drawn. And that those orbs I've learned are the compression of certain materials stacked on top of each other, which then create the orbs. That's where like all those people when they're like, oh, there's all these ghosts over there. Well, there's actually compressions of certain types of materials which stack together, create a chemical reaction, and then you have this orb. But I believe with, this, with the crop circles that it's Mother Earth speaking to us. And when I started to look at all of them, I started to see designs. I started to see like inventions. I started to see actually a lot of things related to atmospheric energy. You know, I started to see alignments, like things like the eclipse and how like significant the eclipse is. And like even here, we had two eclipses, you know, in two weeks. And if you stared into it, your energy goes through the roof. You know, so all these things that Mother Earth is trying to communicate with us. And like you said, we used to be tapped into this. We used to be able to see these frequencies or at least tap into that. And we've disconnected and lost that. But the crop circles things just as wild because they even said too that people will meditate in them. Their energy will go very high. Or they'll notice all these plants, that same thing. The plant growth is like wild. 
And they noticed, what's the other thing? They noticed like all these different types of rare plants popping up in that same spot. So it's almost like, in my opinion, Mother Earth is trying to communicate us and trying to tell you something and you need to pay attention. But we don't understand it anymore because we speak with this new language that we have instead of symbols and shapes and understanding fractals or frequency. You know, because everything has a frequency, everything is a fractal, you know, everything is designed into that. And Marcel Vogel did a lot with that. He did a lot with his crystals and talking to plants and creating liquid crystal displays. But crop circles kind of took me to about a thousand different other rabbit holes that I didn't know I was going to lead to. But it was just remarkable to understand that, you know, this energy is there. It's always present. And, you know, it's for us to tap into. Otherwise, it gets named when pseudoscience and all the Rockefeller terms and everything else. Yeah. And they keep us so distracted and so in fear and, and really compressed so that we don't even, our brain, as soon as we we try to think of that, you know, energy, it goes woo in our head. We, you know, people react to it instead of, you know, looking within their body and releasing the tension inside and all the pain and suffering that we carry, right? Like I'm really um, trying to help people go into their somatic sense and you should shake it out or feel it, like feel their feelings rather than compartmentalize them or mentalize them and allow that process to of release. And once you uncling, then it just naturally starts to, to flow again and happen again. And it just starts to make sense. But when you're in that contracted state, it just doesn't seem, they people don't even know what's reality anymore. And we're seeing that you know, in the world a lot because of what's been happening and all the fear and, you know, distractions and divisions and this sort of stuff. But I feel like we're at like a pinnacle, you know, part in our history where this is all, these are all lessons. They're all challenges. It's like inviting us to step up. Like, will you put on your crown and sit on your throne and become what you were meant to become. And it's not just going to be handed to you because you know, when somebody just gives you everything for free, you don't have, have the same level of gratefulness. You don't have the same preciousness is not around it. You know, we are, I feel we are infinite beings and we, you know, go through these experiences of limitation so we can have that experience of preciousness and beauty and things that are really rare and explore our world in a way that, you know, lifts us and it makes us own it in a different way. So I look at all of it now instead of, oh, it's bad, it's terrible or whatever as, okay, great. The more you keep jacking up those food prices, guys, guess what's going to happen? People aren't going to buy your shit anymore. So like my partner was just at one of the local grocery stores. He's like, it was the weirdest thing ever. It was the middle of the day. Nobody was in there shopping. It was empty. He's like, I've never in my life walked into a grocery store in a town that's empty like that. And to me, it was like, yeah, that's going to be the future. There, there aren't going to be grocery stores like that anymore. They're, they're going to X themselves out because we're waking up and they can't stop it. And the more that we talk about it, the more that we self-realize, I think it's really going to be kind of, you know, beautiful. So like, yeah, you keep jacking up those food prices and we'll have to grow those gardens and we'll have to figure out nicer ways to do it, more effective ways to do it. And we'll seek, you know, the information that, you know, you speak about and we'll be able to form our communities again. And so I really look optimistically towards the future. And I look forward to, you know, even the challenges that come because I want to overcome my challenges. And uh, yeah, so when it comes to, you know, where people should start to learn, I mean, I know it's that simple. Like when I did my TikTok, I was like, just literally wrap a, wrap, get some copper, go, I go into my electrician friend. I said, Hey, you got a bunch of wires. I stripped the wires and I started wrapping and I was amazed. So it's really not difficult. If, so people should not feel overwhelmed, just invite them to like, get it for free and do it. But what kind of other tips and things that you've learned by, you know, actually applying this that you would recommend for people so that they don't make, you know, too many mistakes at the beginning? So like you said, very simple, just a piece of wood wrapped with copper and just start there, put that in your garden and see how it goes. And then if you want to add to it, you can add crystals or stones to the top of it and then make it a little, you know, a little, little more energetic. And then you can also add some basalt, which is volcanic ash. It's gone through the alchemy process of the volcano. And you can put that all around your soil that will help uplift the energy. Because what I started to notice was a lot of this stuff is trying to deaden the energy. All these pesticides and chemicals, they have a lot of iron in them, tons and tons of iron. 
And iron is blocking up the electrical conductivity of the plants. And that's why you see a lot of people, they have plants and the root base is all blocked up, but the top of the plant is thriving. And that root base is basically holding all those chemicals and not being able to move things through. So the cool part with electroculture is you're helping to allow that energy to flow up and down the plant so that the sap can also flow up and down the plant, just like the cycles of the moon. So just simple things. Like I said, you can start real simple, a piece of wood wrapped with copper. You can go to your hardware store, make sure it's real copper. There's a lot of weird stuff online and everything else. Then you can get a little bit of crystals if you want to take it to the next level. You can add some basalt. And then if you want, you can get a copper watering can. You know, putting water in copper helps increase the electrical conductivity. All the watering cans before the 1940s all used to be made out of copper. You can find still some online or at antique stores. And it's just funny because they understood the energetic principle because even the old watering cans used to all have a curvature of the spout because they understood that water is supposed to curve and not go in straight lines. So a simple copper watering can also help increase the electrical conductivity. Because what I started to realize with all of this is plants, when you look at them, yeah, one side that's not doing so well, that's lost the electrical conductivity, and the other side that's thriving. And we're just trying to have that electrical conductivity on both sides and help increase that. But I've seen some remarkable results. And if you want, I'll show you a, a screen share, if that's cool. Sure. Just, just yeah. So you can kind of see some stuff. Just do the share screen. Or do I never? I think you have to enable it. Yeah. See if that works. Oh, there we go. Great. Just. Okay, so now we're on here. Mm -hmm. So this, if you can wow. see that, that is about, a, I think it was 36 pounds or 40 pounds of a watermelon. So that was my buddy. They sent me a message and that's what they grew. And this is what I started to realize is, you know, those whole super pumpkins, you know, those 2000 pound pumpkins, mm -hmm. they just understood the energy, you know, and I'm sure they know the secrets of the energy. That's why they're growing 2000 pound pumpkins. Now, they can be in Alaska and have a lot of sunlight. I know that's an advantage too, but mm -hmm. they definitely understood ley lines and mag uh, magnetism and energy. And then this is a, let me put this over here. This is a friend. She just tagged me the other day. It'll play in a second. These are beets. She just put a simple antenna, nothing crazy. I mean, look at these things. Whoa. Massive. And she just keeps pulling them out. It reminds me of Super Mario Brothers where he's just pulling out the mushrooms, <laughs> you know, yeah. they just keep popping. But just a simple wood wrapped in copper, nothing different, like just remarkable. Wow. And then I try to find a lot of old books all the time. And this is an old book that was in German because a lot of this information I found out is in German, but this is comparing the a plant with electroculture and a plant without electroculture and showing how the plant basically starts to become like its own fertilizer factory and then starts to basically produce all the minerals, which is interesting because all it's doing is tapping into the ether to create these minerals. So if you really think about it, you know, when we're putting things onto plants, it doesn't even make sense if the plant can create it on its own if we just increase the electrical conductivity. And this was a book, I think it was like 1920s that I found or whatever, but it just, you know, all of the stuff dates back. And when you start seeing all of this, you start realizing we could have abundance overnight. You know, this is all easy stuff to have and we can do it very quickly. And all of these little examples, and I, I have a lot more, but we'd have to go through like a bunch of slides. But, you know, th these are just simple examples of how Mother Earth is just doing its own thing all the time. We're just helping to support it. So we can either support it on its electrical conductivity side, or we can diminish it with pesticides, Monto Monsanto, and DDT is good for me. Yeah, right. Look at the lime, though. Wow. You would think the they all go on wax on about nitrogen, but the lime is quite a jump. Well, and that's the thing, too, is, you know, a lot of this has started to teach me kind of like different things that what we were told, you know, NPK, you know, we're always hearing NPK and these things. But maybe things are much different than what we kind of assume, you know, mm -hmm. and I, a lot of these old books, you get into some of these and you see like 
how much you can grow on one acre and they got like, you know, a thousand plants and whatever else and numbers that you're like, wait, what? You know, how do you have, you know, 1000 or 10,000 plants in one acre? So it really starts to make me also wonder, well, <laughs> we don't know much about this realm. You know, like we, we know only a small smidge. And like I was saying, the 2000 pound pumpkins, there was a friend, he, he, read, he did a documentary, Primordial Code, and we talked in that one. And he showed that if you increase the static fields of things, you can make things even larger or more prehistoric than they used to be. And it was fascinating because there were these scientists who were, they were, I believe, in Switzerland. They basically took fish eggs and put them in a box, which replicated the static fields of the magnetosphere above, up, up and above the ionosphere. And what they noticed was where these fish basically had jawlines like a salmon when they were originally a trout. Wow. If you think of all the things we could be incorporating, and this is obviously taking it into a whole nother, you know, realm, but we could be doing a lot more than what we even realize. And then that comes into question, what, is, what are genetics then? Because if that energy is shifting what's happening, whatever we're calling DNA or, or our nucleic acid material, then that's switching on or off different gene expressions you know, which is also when we talk about disease, we have epigenetics. And so it's really the factors that affect the cell membrane that trigger the waters to activate, you know, whatever's expressed. And that means, you know, we can affect that using this knowledge. And so it has implications everywhere. And with that, they actually, once he started doing that, they actually stopped the studies. Because they basically had a regular trout that was about this big. And then they had a trout which looked like a salmon with the jaw of a salmon. And it was wild because the whole reason this was created, this guy created this static field box, was because he wanted something to get rid of the GMOs. If you're going to try to do gene editing, I'm going to come up with a counter. And then if you think about, like you just said, if you induce static fields, you also create hurricanes and you can do a lot more as well too, mm. but you can also create giants or big people. So if you think about certain things of static fields, you know, in all these times of, you know, these times where you go back into things like this, that used to be all over the United States and all these big, beautiful buildings and everything else, you know, you sit there and wonder, well, you got a 200 foot door. Why'd you have a 200 foot door? You know, people are six feet tall. Well, unless there were much bigger people. And that could explain either bigger trees like the sequoias. Maybe there's higher static fields in that area, or it could explain bigger people. And then, like you said, with illness, you might be able to heal somebody just by changing the static field like that. And then you don't need all the toxins and anti-life products. You just need to change the field, which think of what the cell phone towers are doing, changing the fields. So it's mm -hmm. almost like somebody knows how to do the opposite, but we need to work on bringing it back. Imagine they're working to make us smaller on purpose because we were giant and they're, they don't like us. I don't know why, <laughs> but they don't. And so how do we get rid of all the plebs? Well, let's just like miniaturize them and make them as inefficient as possible and attack them from all angles. But man, we must have a lot of power. I mean, why would they go to such lengths to try to take away all of this knowledge and awareness you know, and while they say that they're trying to help and all this kind of narcissistic crap, but it, it we can actually unfold that we could get become giant again, because I was uh, wondering about what happened with, you know, the mud flood or whatever, you know, happened to melt, you know, stone and things that seem to be flash pointed. And I thought, I wonder what they did to the ether. Did they ignite it? Did they collapse something what happened in a moment you know where everything seemed to fall away and the people to seem to disappear and we had the orphan trains we have all these unanswered questions of what the hell happened back then and how they reseeded the population and that making us smaller or engineering us smaller you know does make sense from a control perspective what else did you sort of find when it when you dove into you know that knowledge so the other part that was happening was with the plants. So a corn stalk usually has just its one stalk. And when they would induce it into high static fields, it would basically look like this like prehistoric corn stalk with seven, seven different stalks going out and then all these other basically corns on it. 
and it was just absolutely massive. Then they took something like a fern, which was just this little cute bush, and they put it in the static fields, the seeds in the static field, and the bush looked like something that was just like out of the jungle. So, and this is in real time. This is like 2000, you know, 17. This is not far away, like in a time or 2014, sorry. But, you know, this is not in like, you know, a, a fantasy time in which we were told this is recent. So, you know, we could do a lot and it just really makes you wonder like what the true potential then of our crystalline structure is. Because like you were saying, everything is water. So if you understand the water and you understand the mechanisms of water, there must be some very true potential. And it made me kind of think about all the stuff from the medieval times of like the suits of armor that people used to wear. And they weighed like, you know, anywhere where you got 200 to 1,000 pounds, you know, crazy weights. And you're sitting there thinking, well, who could carry that on a horse, you know, on a chariot while they're riding around on wooden wheels and all this stuff that they tell us, you know, but maybe if you induce static fields, you can then just levitate because mm -hmm. maybe that's what our bodies are meant to do. And monks have shown this. Monks have levitated. They've actually shown them just levitating. And also around the full moon, anybody can levitate because there's a perfect polarity shift that occurs that allows the body to basically become not, not magnetic so that it floats. You know, so when we get into all of this, I truly start to think the whole Super Saiyans and Goku and all that stuff they've shown in cartoons is actually our true potential. But we just mm -hmm. haven't learned how to tap into it or connect into it because it's been shown as you know, it's fantasy. But in reality, it's actually our reality all the time. Wow. I, I actually levitated my body one time. I was in California. I was at a non-denominational monastery and I was doing a lot of meditation at the time. And I went and they had a huge extensive historical library and I grabbed a Tibetan text and it had an exercise in it. And basically you did opened your chakras and then you started to spin your fields in two directions. And I thought, cool, I'm going to go put myself in one of the little areas. And they had these little um, trailers for guests. I'm going to just lay down. And I'm going to do it. Why not? You know? And so I started to do it and I was on the bed and there was like, it was like an old sort of bus looking thing. And then the window was up here. So I was spinning. It felt really great. And then I was look. I decided to look over to my right, and I was looking out the window. And I'm going, how can I be looking out the window when I'm laying on the bed, which is below the window? Like this doesn't make sense. And I was trying to find my mind around it. And then the second I realized that I was off the bed, I went, oh, like I just sort of freaked out and I and dropped. I just dropped to the bed. And then I tried to recreate it, and I couldn't because my mind got all up in it, right? Because I was trying to think it through rather than feel it through. And, you know, with the Adam and Eve story and like the eating the apple in the tree. And I'm like, what's that really about? You know, that's like atom, the atom and electricity and that we ate from the tree of knowledge and we got stuck up here, you know, and we've lost so much with our intelligentsia. You know, we think we're so freaking smart, but really we're just we have disconnected. We cut off our heads from our bodies. And the real information is body is in and through our body you know I explain uh, to people you know think about if you think about someone you know really well how you feel about them and the knowledge and information that comes from that but then try to tell someone that you'd have to write a book to try to explain it to somebody right mm -hmm. and so that means the body intelligence is higher than the mental intelligence and I think once we put all these pieces together, we're going to have where we are going to have a real revolution on our hands because it is quick to get to the solutions. Like you were saying, it's just so fascinating. There's so much knowledge here. Did you ever read the book Infinite Mind by Valerie Hunt? No, I don't think so. You would like it because it talks about how your aura or your essence, your ether, the little, you know, your bubble that's around you picks yeah. up on everything before your spinal cord and your brain. And basically that's, you know, where your trauma is obviously stored. And then, you know, everything that of an injury is picked up on your, by your aura first. And it goes into that. But like you just said, this information comes very fast because it's very natural to us. Everything we said in school learning about, you know, 1492, Christopher Columbus, Ocean Blue nonsense and whatever else, that's all just a bunch of rhetoric to keep our minds busy. But once we start tapping into this, like you said, we just, it just comes very quickly. And it's funny that you said that there's a book, Philip Callahan, he talked about those Celtic round towers 
if you remember those in Ireland, he said that monks used to go to the top of them so that they could levitate and they could communicate amongst each other. Because he said, why, if it was war that you used a round tower, why would you go to the top of a round tower and try to defend yourself? You're in the worst predicament. You know, you're at the top. They obviously get you. But he was saying because the composition of the materials being magnetic and non-magnetic put together would allow people to basically use the Celtic round towers as communication devices, just like the star system above. So one could connect and talk to the other and then also levitate and put themselves into this state so they could actually communicate amongst each other. Because if you think about like all of this technology and everything that you know you just mentioned and things, these were the same buildings and everything was built the exact same all over the world. So somebody mm -hmm. had to have been communicating, not by telephone, that's for sure. Somebody had to be communicating in the ether to be able to replicate the same thing in every continent across the world. And that's where, you know, you get into the energy or the ether, which, as we talked about, was removed from the periodic table. And this is why I feel it's not discussed. But we naturally want to tap into all of this because it's in our soul. You know, this is more than just me meeting you on a podcast. We've already met. We already know each other. It's just reconnecting in whatever timeline of our current realm that we're in at the moment. That might explain even dreams completely different. You know, because I'm, I'm a huge dreamer. I dream of all kinds of scenarios. I used to predictive dream. You know, I would get up the next day and I knew exactly how the day was going to go because I just dreamt it. And my daughter has it as well. She gets these all the time. She knows what's going to happen. And so then you can also, you know, get into deeper layers of how you're interacting with this reality. Like I read a series of books called about the Ascended Masters many moons ago. And what they they did that, as you were saying, with their communication, they'd get on mountains. They'd also use a lot of mountains. And they could actually, with their minds connected, form bridges between mountains just out of light. So they could walk from one mountain peak to the next mountain peak to visit one another. So, I mean, th now I've read that thinking it was a fantasy story or, you know, whatever at the time, but that could be reality because we know that this is just a slow down light, right? So if we can get to a place where we're actually forming this, that's, it's going to change everything. I mean, the crystal palaces they used to have alone, how the heck did they even build any of that? I mean, look at the architecture now from now to before then. I mean, people don't even understand why we have red bricks on the, you know, on all these buildings and why we had the red and white stripe, you know, lighthouses and all of these things. Like there's just, there's just, it's out there to be found this knowledge. And do you have sort of like a resource list on your website or what kind of resources do you provide for people to get them caught up in some of this stuff? So I, I have a YouTube channel and a Rumble channel, and I put a lot of this information on there. I also put it on our website. But in the captions, I'll usually put the books, you know, so all the different books that I've kind of gone through or whatever, but just based on the topic. So if you want to, you know, Chicago 1893, you know, I have the books in there and even like the pictures so that people can kind of see because pictures kind of change everything. You know, when you see pictures of things that are allegedly, you know, temporary buildings and all the nonsense that we were told, you know, you really start to see things differently. And like you said, you know, how are they moving the resources? Because if something weighed like 500,000 tons, how would you get the granite to do that? And then number two, where did you get the copper and gold and brass and bronze from? Because that's even another factor that's not even put in there. All the metal, you know, the metal uh, construction that's being done and statues and all these angels and all these things. How would you do that, too? You know, that, that's like a whole nother thing. So but you can find I, I put the information up on our YouTube. I put it on our Rumble and then. We have a Telegram channel that I put a lot of stuff in there where I you know, can talk about because I don't get censored at least. But I try to put out as many things out there so that people can just see a different side, you know, and I try to see different sides of everything because, as you already know, all, all, everything is inverted or the opposite or just not even what we would think or, like you said, turn to fantasy. You know, that's the other thing. They want us to believe that this is fantasy, but there's a great video I saw where a monk starts a fire with his hand from yeah. just the chi energy from his hand, and he shows him lighting papers on fire. So that energy is always there. And this is where you get into hand healing too. When people are healing people with their hands, 
you have your usually your right side, which is your conductive side, your left side, which is your grounding side. And when you put your hands on that person, you're creating a circuit and creating that energy. You know, so this exists in so many different realms. We're just tapping into it and seeing it all as a kind of like a full spectrum at the same time. I have a shungite and a soapstone pole that I hold, and I, it does that for the body. It actually creates the static electricity and allows the flow into your body just by holding those two correctly in your, your hands. That, that's it. I mean, it's that simple. We have, we just, it's exciting actually, because, you know, we've been so suppressed and so kind of dull <laughs> for a long time. And we see the world as chaotic and discordant and we want solutions. I mean, I'm always looking for solutions, but we have them. That's the great news. It's right, literally right before you. And so we don't have to get stuck and we don't have to stay in fear. We can actually begin, like you said, begin at home, just take, put one foot in front of the other and know that we have access to free energy for our, our health, for our healing, for our food, for all the things we need to be happy and healthy and free. And uh, I promote it everywhere I can. And I know you do as well. And this is what the future holds for us uh, if we literally, you know, grab it by the brass balls. <laughs> That's what we're doing. That's what we're That's doing. That's what we're doing, you know, and we don't have to worry about war. We don't have to be afraid of any of these things because our energy actually feeds all that. That's why they want, we, they want our minds. They want our energy. They want our emotions because emotion is our frequency and we keep feeding everything with our emotions all the time. And even lately, I don't even care about social media as much. I'm not as interested. I, I was like, what's wrong? You know, I'm, I should be promoting. I should be. And I'm like, no, something's changing. I'm changing. I, my focuses need to change. And so when those changes come, I just sit with them for a while and go, okay, what do you want me to see? What should I be looking at? And it's because I shouldn't even be putting the, the no one with dirty feet should walk, you know, in my palace, right? And yeah. we don't need it anymore. You know, it's not about even being informed anymore. What we need to be informed on is this. And so I thank you so much for, you know, all the work you're doing and you're really making quite a big splash. I see you all over TikTok. Thank God for TikTok. <laughs> I mean, I, they wanted to ban that one. That was one they were trying to get rid of because that one's speaking a lot of truths, you know, and yeah. that, that I saw that I was like, you know, they want to ban that, but they don't want to ban these going to people, you know, and put, trying to put all the pokes into the people and whatever else. But, you know, it's just, yeah, think, think I'm thankful for social media and, and I, I've seen it differently, you know, before, like you said, I used to see social media as just, I don't know, a big ball of chaos, but there's just a lot of solutions that have came from it and all the platforms, you know, even us just being able to speak and all these platforms that have came about are really also what's accelerating all of this movement, you know, that people can speak and, and give another side, because like you said, they just want us consumed. And every month there's an event, like literally every month there's something. Now there's this and now there's that. It's every month. And I've like, I'm sitting there going, man, this is just like, they're just, they got to be, you know, worried that they're trying to orchestrate something all the time. Because like you said, there's such a shift happening and people are over it and the energy is uplifting and I see it and I, I continue to keep seeing it. And it's just going to keep going like that because after a while you can only push people in, into this box where you try to control them and, you know, cause inflation and everything else, where people are just going to say, I'm not being a part of this. You go figure it out with, your, with yourself. I'm going to be doing over here. We're going to be uplifting everything. Yeah, that's exactly. I remember Dolores Cannon, it, you know, sometimes my spiritual teachers say, sometimes you'll get a little tidbit and you don't know maybe why, but she said, just file it. So you'll get a little thing, just file it, just hold it. You don't have to dissect it. And so she said, there'll be a split between the worlds, right? And back when I was in my new agey phase, I'm like, oh, the earth's going to split into two and, you know, but no, it was this, <laughs> it was, people are going to choose whether they want to spiral down or spiral up. And that's the, the split. And the two can't even really see each other. And I wonder if literally like they wouldn't be able to see it, you know, like what mirages are, maybe they're not mirages at all. Maybe we just don't have the eyes to see because it's of a different frequency set. And we have to match that in order to really, you know, be safe with that information. It could even be protection for us in that situation that we might have a spiritual shock, you know, that we have to come gradually into some of this information, but really there's just so much willful ignorance at this stage that they're just going to 
you know, they're going to go off in their little prison, whatever they want, their little meta prison, and we're going to do this. And so we don't have to worry about it. We just have to keep creating it. And, and you reminded me of when I was a kid and I saw my father do laying on of hands, you know, it's like every time he said people were ill, his hands just started to heat up and he just naturally knew to put his hands on people. And he didn't know what he was doing. He didn't have a booklet or anything and people would feel better. And so I started to do it just naturally. And I had the same phenomenon. And so then I started training in Reiki and all these different energy modalities. Cause I, I was wanting to know why, what was happening, you know, and because I'm very sciencey in the sense that I, I want to pick it apart. I want to get to the real nuts and bolts of like why I'm here and all these things. So in my seeking, you know, it really brought me to this full awareness as like the wounded healer path. And it's profound. I mean, you really are pulling in that static electricity. Like you said, you can see in the energy field, if an accident is planned, you know, you can clear it, you can cut those cords, you can feel, hear those, there's holes, you can actually see it. There's a woman named Barbara Brennan, she was a clairvoyant, and she could visualize holes in the field, she could visualize emotions, how they came out of the body and like attacked people or went into their field. And you could clear all of that, even your karmic contracts and stuff, you can clear them. And whatever is meant to come back to you, you just, you naturally it will because it's like a magnet. So, you know, we're getting, making it easier for ourselves as we do this. And I, I always was shy about talking about Reiki and energy healing because a lot of Christians would come at me and say, you know, it's devil's work and all this kind of stuff. I'm like, well, how though? (laughs) Like, It's love. It's basically, you just love that person and wish them well. And it all starts to happen naturally for them. And then they get their own realizations. No one needs to tell them what to think or how to behave or what to even do for themselves. And they would even find their own healing. Like they go, Oh, now I have to go to a chiropractor. I know intuitively that, you know, I need to do that or whatever, you know? And so nobody has to be disempowered. And also you need no dictator and no man in a white coat or woman in a white coat to say, take this medication. And if you don't do the surgery, you're going to die in seven days and this kind of crap. It's all illusion, all of it. So, you know, I'm really looking forward to to the future now, as opposed to how I used to feel about it. I was cons- very worried and angry, you know, that I've looked at some of my old videos and I'm like fucking so angry, right? I'm like, yeah. I don't need to, yeah. I don't need yeah. to be angry anymore. I used to sit on my balcony. I would make like five minute videos, you know, and I watched the video and I was like, oh my gosh, I was mad, you know, mad at the world. I, and, you <laughs> know, obviously we have a right to be, but it just, you know, there's better ways to it. And, you know, there are solutions to all of it. And that's what I realized. And even like you just said, with the, you know, with the frequency or the witchery and the, and the sorcery, those are all terms that were created for anybody who was healing for free or creating their own independence. Even if you were a dowser and you were going around with dowsing rods, you know, they called them a sorcerer or a witch because they weren't dependent on the kingdom anymore. You know, so that's what the beautiful part of all of this is all you're doing is tapping into vortexes oscillations and same with your hands there's a vortex in each one you can do that little fun game you know where you just do a little uh, string on top and you can feel the energy popping right out of your hand but it's just it's it's beautiful that you know we're obviously connecting to this and it's only going to continue and i feel like all of this was a stepping stone and what's funny is me and you were talking about the same topic yet not talking at the exact same time and i remember people sending me your videos and i I don't know if they're sent mine oh yeah but it was like this whole thing. And you sit there and see there's so much synchronicity happening. And this is all happening. And you either come onto that timeline or that path, like you just said, or you're still going on this one. And this one is, a, a, in my opinion, is just a train wreck that's falling apart, you know, and you can mm-hmm. see it. And this one, in my opinion, is elevating and going up and we're going into a bright future. I feel like we're going to, some of the preparedness that has come is that I feel like though some of those people we're going to be like, okay, at the end of it, I'll be like, okay, come on. It's okay. We got it set up. Just come on in. We'll debrief you. You know, we'll fix, we'll, I got some tuning forks and some stuff like nice. we'll fix this. Don't worry. Right. Because there'll be people lost like that. I feel once, and, and especially the ones who are the controller subtypes where they're like just the obedient ones. It's, you know, they get a good salary enough or whatever, but they're, you know, the ones who are the order pushers and they will, they are not going to be protected. They think they are by following orders, but they won't, they'll be left to the the wayside as well. 
and they'll need a little bit of love, I think, <laughs> or a lot of love yes. at the end of that. So any final words, anything you want to, do you want to just give us your, any other details of your website stuff? And, and then we'll say sayonara to our wonderful group. So on this one, all I can say is, you know, you can remove the fear and there are always solutions. And that's what our company has been about. You know, I mean, the whole path has been just trying to provide a solution and counter to everything because there is, you know, we don't have to live in this fear and nonsense and everything else. And if somebody wants to find us, they can go on cultivateelevate.com. You know, we have all this information on there. There's a ton of blogs and all types of things. Anything you want to look up, you know, there's a whole bunch of different information. And I try to give a little bit of everything and dabble into everything and just kind of show a different side. Because I feel like that's what's always missing. You know, we're always repeating the same things. And when people are seeking books, because I'm all about people reading as many books as possible, look for books before 1920s. If you look at books before 1920s, it is a completely night and day different world with technology, buildings, designs, anything you can think of, even gardening, very different world. And about that time is when everything changed. So, you know, when it comes to that, pick up some books, get some incandescent bulbs, sit and do some sun gazing and connect to nature. Nice. That's great. That's great parting words, Matt. I totally second that. Thanks again for everything you do. And you can find my work at yummy.doctor. You guys know where to find me and we'll maybe we'll do this again.